So coloniality, so coloniality, I want you to think of coloniality as essentially the structures which enabled colonialism. So it's both the social orders and it's the forms of knowledge that are produced under colonialism and which continue to exist even after independence is achieved. Um, and so the big question for post-colonial societies is what should our newly found identity be? You can't return to who you were before colonialism. Uh, so you have to think about a new identity which both incorporates the trauma of colonialism, but also seeks to resurrect many of the ideals and values that were uh, essentially considered to be worthless uh, by those that were in governance. And so it's about learning to over overturn what the, uh, the African thinker Imi Cizal describes of millions of men who've been skillfully injected with fear, inferiority complexes, trepidation, servility, despair, and abasements. So just those. That's, that's all that you have to get over as an entire society in order to come to think of yourself in autonomous terms. Um, and as I said, there could be no return to what was before. So this has led to very painful conversations in post-colonial societies across the world um, about what exactly that new identity should be. And what I find interesting in those conversations is that actually th there's... Um, a recognition of the harms that happened under colonialism, but during those, uh, those conversations, there's also uh, a recognition of what, not wanting to repeat some of the uh, patterns of thinking that happened then, and so to produce perhaps a, a more socially conscious form of renewal, uh, which learns from uh, the mistakes of the past. Now, what was very interesting to me, uh, being um, half French myself, was the extent to which the conversations about post-colonial identity aren't really happening in what were the centers of empire. So the centers of empire are the places where the systems of thought which allowed the subjugation, which permitted, which facilitated the subjugation of entire parts of the world, which essentially created uh, moral, social hierarchies of human beings, have not been properly challenged in the very hearts of uh, empire where they were being developed. And so my big question is whether or not we shouldn't maybe be concerned about the extent to which those systems of thought continue to permeate the way we think about the world and continue to influence structures within our own society. Uh, and perhaps uh, we, in not dealing with that legacy, are missing out also uh, on fully acknowledging the wealth of ideas um, and uh, cultural input that we can get from everybody who is now British today. So. So, as I said, I don't feel there's been a proper uh, questioning of uh, the center. And I think, for me, it's a little bit... The analogy I would make is one of um, a, a sort of very vicious crime having occurred. The victims are left reeling from that act. They're struggling to find a new normal. They're struggling to develop an identity in the wake of that trauma. And the perpetrator sort of um, doesn't see a reason to address the reasons that led them to undertake that action in the first place. So my suggestion is that there needs to be a sort of proper moral inventory within colonial centers to assess how it is that, as cultures, we not only fostered ideas which permitted the subjugation of others, but developed you know, entire uh, cu cultural corpuses around this, from literature to the arts to philosophy. Um, our societies, in many ways, were built uh, out of a, a sense of supremacy over others. And if we don't dismantle that, we will continue to feed that to people in various ways. Now. Um, Given that culture was both a means and an end of colonial conquest, I think there's a responsibility, therefore, for us to assess how contemporary culture both perpetuates and departs, of course, from colonial assumptions. Now, my premise is that we haven't really dealt with this issue properly, and, and my reasons for thinking this are manifold. Um, I'll start out with um, things like, you know, uh, Jeremy Paxman's series a few years ago called Empire, which essentially sought to uh, highlight all of the, the great things that the British Empire had done in the world, and let's not be so hard on ourselves. Um, or more recently, a professor at my uh, former uh, university, Professor Nigel Bigar, who called for the British to moderate our post-imperial guilt just as he begins to head up a new five-year project entitled Ethics and Empire, 
uh, which essentially seeks to argue for the moral worth of empire. And they're not alone. Um, that's kind of the issue. <laughs> they're not alone in that um, a recent YouGov poll shows that almost 60% of Britons think the British Empire is something to be proud of rather than ashamed of. Almost 50% think that the colonized countries are better off being colonized. And a third of British people said they would like it if Britain still had an empire. Don't worry about asking the people under the empire. That, that bit doesn't, that's irrelevant to the conversation. But, but in many ways, this nostalgia, British nostalgia for empire, shouldn't really come as a surprise in the wake of the argument that I've been building. By and large, the memory of empire has been preserved through the lens of the victors. It's a rose-tempted attempt in many ways to find moral good in an em enterprise which we need to be honest about never had at its core the well-being of the colonized. And that needs, that, that's a really important fact to bear in mind because, you know, people like to bring in the railways and, you know, there was a few hospitals set up. Sure, that was never the objective. We were not there to assist anyone. Now, rarely have we heard from the viewpoint of the colonizers themselves, and that, that to me is one of the bigger missions here that I don't think we hear enough from those who were the victims of empire. Um, and more than this, I feel that the cultural edifices, the literature, the films, the philosophy, the art, all of the things which buttressed and fueled empire haven't really been dismantled. So back to my personal story and my interest in this, I took up a position after my PhD at SOAS, for those of you who don't know it, it's the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, which was actually founded to further imperial interests uh, initially, but now prides itself on being uh, the, the, the bad kids of uh, academia. Um, I'll let you decide that for yourselves. Um, so my university is basically a growing, one of a growing number which uh, is trying to call for a decolonization of education. What does that mean, I hear you say? Well, decolonizing education is... Uh, a project that has many facets to it. Um, in many ways, it started with it, start, it started in South Africa. The movement with a call to tear down the statue of Cecil Rhodes, who's considered the uh, architect of apartheid, uh, and whose statue was at the centre of the campus at the University of Cape Town. Now, in parallel to that campaign, a number of students at the University of Oxford also started to call for. Uh, the statue to be called down. There's a, a big statue of Rhodes also uh, at uh, Oriel Co College um, in Oxford. In the wake of this, other movements at other universities started to do the same thing and begin their own decolonized campaigns. At Queen Mary University in London, a plaque to the Belgian King Leopold, uh, who was responsible for the massacre of millions of uh, people from the Congo, was removed. Um, at Oxford, there was a change in the history degree to include uh, non-British and non-European uh, examinations within the history degree. And UCL itself has run a course called, uh, a campaign rather called, Why is my curriculum uh, white? Criticizing uh, the dominance of white Eurocentric writers and thinkers in degree courses. Because, you know, um, there were people outside of the white Western world who, who did theorize and think about the world in ways which are actually quite valuable to us and may actually help us to think about issues not only in different ways, but in ways which might help um, address some of the problems we face today. At my own university, students set up the Decolonize Our Mind campaign, and there's currently a conversation um, with uh, the authorities on campus about how to decolonize the campus. But it's not just happening here. In America, Harvard recently announced the unveiling of a plaque dedicated to the memory of four slaves who lived and worked at the home of the university's former president. Uh, Drew Faust declared that the institution was, I quote, directly complicit in America's system of racial bondage, and that despite some efforts, the history of slavery at Harvard had rarely, rarely been acknowledged or invoked. In Australia, New South Wales University recently set new guidelines stating that Australia's history should be described as an invasion and occupation rather than a softer sounding settlement. In brief, the decolonizing movement is already in motion. It's beginning to happen, but it's not just happening here. It's happening internationally because there's a growing recognition that 
there are currently two histories being told, and until we start to merge them, none of us are really getting the full picture. I want to say uh, thank you so much for listening. It's the beginning of a conversation, and I hope it will continue. Thank you.